everyone and thanks so much for joining us for this uh, Women of the World Festival in Pakistan online. Um, I'm here with the amazing Yasmin Lari, Yasmin Appa as I like to call her. Um, but just a quick introduction to myself. Um, my name is Pavinda Marwaha and I work uh, for the British Council within the architecture design and fashion team. I look after the regions Europe and South Asia and over the years, I've done a number of programs in South Asia, and I'm so happy to be co-designing a program with Yasmin Appa around um, supporting gender equality. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that soon. Uh, but I thought I would give an introduction um, to Yasmin. Now, just before the call, we discussed how I would introduce Yasmin Appa actually, because she's done so many profound things. A lot of people already know her within the international context and especially in Pakistan for being Pakistan's first and most profound female architect. But when I asked her, she said, um, you know, I want to be known as the architect for the poorest of the poor. And um, I guess I'll start with Yasmin Y, um, you know, and what led her to to actually want that to be her um, drive, actually. Well, thank you so much, Pavinda. It's just lovely to be able to talk to you here. And, you know, we've discussed so many things uh, with the program and uh, it's just amazing how you are driving it. So it's wonderful. Um, I love it because it's my favorite topic, which is zero carbon structures and so uh, and, and we've got all these women involved in the work but uh, I, you know I, of course there are so many architects in the world who are doing such amazing work and I think I feel that you know I really can't compete with them so the best thing is for me to just withdraw and you know just talk about you know the, the things that I love to do which is to work for the poor and um, um, it's not I've not always been like this it's uh, more like for the last about you know 15 or 16 years that I uh, got an opportunity to work with marginalized communities and with really with women. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And I feel that this is something that I want to do. And I, you know, I never knew that it could be so rewarding. So I, I like this title because it's a Politecnico di Milano who they started to call me this when, you know, they were sort of very kindly giving me an honorary degree. So I think it's a nice title. It uh, shows what I'm trying to do and what I want to do. So that's why. Well, I love it. And I know that, you know, you've done so much work to try and support communities, but not just by offering them um, materials or, or free things or getting donations. But I think a lot of our programme around gender, which we've been working on for the last few years, is really about supporting women um, and communities themselves to understand more of their environment and to really be able to use the tools that they have themselves to build themselves so they're not relying on other people. Um, like the real empowerment that we've been sp speaking about for quite a while. Um, and I guess in the context of that, um, can you share a little about what the context in Pakistan is and why it's so urgent, um, you know, for our programme in terms of, of supporting women and climate change in particular? So what's the urgency behind looking at that, I guess, for you? Well, you know, Pavinda, um, uh, things are pretty grim right now. I mean, the climate change is affecting all of us globally. It's not just one country or the other. And as it happens, Pakistan is fifth, the most vulnerable country in the world. So we get a lot of, uh, really a, <laughs> more than a fair share of all kinds of uh, hazards like floods and earthquakes and high winds. And and it's just, a, it's just terrible because uh, when the disaster strikes, and unfortunately, because we've never really try to uh, build up the capacities of people uh, of the people who are so called you know the ones who are living on the borders to try to see how they can fend for themselves so i've seen a lot of destruction and i've seen a lot of displacement and especially of women and children because they're the ones who get really they're the worst sufferers when something like that happens and as you must know uh, if a disaster strikes and people get displaced 
it takes a very long time for them to get rehabilitated and they're never really able to have access to what I call rights-based development, which is so essential for women, which is to do with shelter, a safe shelter, something that will not be you know, washed away or will collapse uh, uh, with an earthquake. And, and certainly sanitation and water and clean food. I mean, uh, you know, my, my Pakistan chula or something on which you can cook and serve uh, clean food to your, your family. And they, they never have access to these things. I mean, most, most people in my part of the world and a lot of you know, South Asia and Sub-Sahara Africa, there are billions of people who don't have access to any of those things. And I think the issue is that uh, unless we focus on women, uh, we will never get there because they're the ones who become a driving force. So really, you know, I mean, I, I love working with them, not because, um, um, uh, you know, I feel that, you know, it's a good thing to sell, but because it is now. And, you know, but I think because they really are the ones who suffered the most, most indignities in life. And they are the ones who need a lot of help. And they're the ones who will, if you were to train them and get them up to speed, they're the ones who will then take everything forward. Uh, and I've seen just amazing work being done by women who are non-literate, who've got nothing, the, you know, the, really the most uh, suffering from the most abject poverty. And you just need to give them a helping hand and they will just rise. So they're the ones that we have to take forward. They're the ones who are suffering the most. So that's why. Yeah, and that just um, reminded me um, of why we even call this uh, cooking it up with uh, cooking things up with Yasmin Lari because through the the program and through all the conversations we've had, um, cooking and food became a vital part in why you know you knew that women could actually do this. And and I'm picking on the point of literacy here because. As you said, most, a lot of these women in these environments are illiterate. But what we talked about was other forms of literacy, which I found, you know, really amazing. And again, I mentioned this quote to you because I love it so much and it's dear to my heart. But when we said, so what made you think that they could do it and they were going to do it, you know, um, and you said, I knew that if they could mix flour and water to make roti, they could mix earth and water to make bricks. And that really stood out to me. Looking at the other forms of literacy, of making, of, of hands. So can you speak more about how food and cooking and those skills are empowering tools for women um, instead of barriers? Yes, you know, uh, women have been really, um, uh, uh, the work that they do has never been acknowledged most of the time. I mean, it's true as much for Western societies, you know, the global north, as much as it is for the global south. Um, and and uh, more so, of course, in global south, because, uh, uh, you know, women are really totally oppressed and nobody thinks they can do anything right and or they can, you know, think about things. But the fact is that the whole training from childhood really, uh, you know, equips them to be able to do many things. And... Uh, and, you know, first of all, multitasking. So they do so many things at the same time. I mean, I've seen women who, you know, are doing these uh, like terracotta tiles or some other kind of uh, craft and so on. And they keep on mending the children at the same time. So they're just, you know, they're just around them and they manage everything. Uh, I mean, that's the first skill that they learn, basically, because they have to do so many things. And it, it, the poorer you are, the more tasks uh, a woman has to carry because nobody else will help her. So, and then cooking itself, of course, equips you to do so many things. Uh, I mean, roti is of course a very good example because in our part of the world, everybody has to learn to make a roti and, uh, and uh, the way they mix the flour. And when we started this program of um, terracotta tiles and the clay has to be done very, very carefully. It's got to be clean properly, then you need it. And there are a whole lot of processes that you have to go through before you can get a really good terracotta tile. And these women are just amazing how they do it because they've done it all their lives, basically, you know. And similarly, the stitching that they do. So thatch roofs that I promote very much, uh, we make these prefab or we've taught them how to make prefabricated thatch roofs and they stitch them so beautifully, you know. 
or tying knots around bamboo or or even drilling and even uh, cutting you know they have learned how to do it and they or they pick all these things up so fast so there's a lot of similarity in the tasks that they perform and the construction activities i mean brick of course is one that's for centuries they've been doing but the way they decorate them it's all that they've learned through childhood through their mothers and their mothers before them so all this you know creativity is actually inbuilt within them and and whenever they get a chance to to exhibit that they will do it so it's just quite incredible how much you know they can they can in fact do yeah yeah i think that was the motivation behind why we chose to take some of these topics for this call where we were talking about okay we're looking at zero carbon architecture we're looking at these amazing structures what we're doing within the programming what the women are doing but really it was about the everyday things that sometimes are under acknowledged that's what we were saying um yeah. that really equip them to be not only like basic to be able to do them but really good at them that's what we were saying like like you said the embroidering it's their inherent skills and like their embodied skills that are going to help them build their own shelters essentially and i guess still on the the topic though of um kind of food and cooking out of the different designs that you've done um for their basic communities which was the small shelter the toilet there was the cooker and we yeah. talked about design for dignity and you know even literally lifting them off the ground um yeah. with your design with the steps so can you talk a little bit more about that idea of yeah. dignity for women and also the design of the chula my concern have been has been for a long time how do you ensure that people don't get displaced families don't get displaced and so with floods um uh, i've always um uh, advocated building uh, earthen platforms because that means that you know you, you they, they don't get washed away and this uh, because i like to work from uh, by drawing examples from tradition and from heritage and we have this amazing um, uh, bronze age site called mohenjodaro and it is surviving for these centuries i mean that's about you know 5000 or 6000 years old and it's surviving because it's built on platforms and because it's a you know it's an a, in a river and belt and so it's it's always vulnerable it's got always you know possibility of flooding and it survived and so we need to keep on learning from what has been there and so platforms is something that i advocate and since i work as you probably know i only work in earth and lime and bamboo and earth is just amazing material that women really know how to use i mean if you look at the way they plaster a wall it is with so much love and care it's incredible you know the no man will ever do it that way but there is everything is something it's so tactile it's something that they can feel and they feel for it for the material you know that's the most important thing and so the chula of course i designed to be elevated because i don't know people who are familiar with with our you know the south asia particularly and i think also in sub saharan africa and other you know similar situations women are crouching on the floor and there is this open fire kind of three brick contraption that they make on which they put a pan and they they burn wood you know for the fire for the fuel and they they the smoke gets into their eyes they inhale it and they allows everything is you know they, they, they really suffer such diseases i can't tell you and the children get burned and i mean they get burned too because of their clothes i mean the clothes are really the way our clothes are they they i mean for a hazard i mean it, they, you just actually invite hazards to yourself so uh so i wanted to elevate them and then i i you know this particular chula is our this bako swiss technology that partners who designed it in a very kind of scientific manner which is a little thing on top of a of a of a uh, an earthen platform and i had not realized uh, how much value it will add to their lives because it's i mean i was thinking of you know less fuel and smokeless and health issues and a fire hazard and you know as soon as they sat on the on this platform the earthen platform it's nothing more than that and it was like a throne for them suddenly they were elevated uh, suddenly everybody kind of you know started to pay them respect they were sitting on the platform they would cook and they would give it out like a you know like somebody is giving out sort of goodies and largesse to the children and everybody as it became a social platform uh, stories were being told children were gathering around 
and more and more they started to use it as a workplace. So all their sewing, all their making, everything started to happen on that platform. And suddenly, you know, they, they, they had dignity. They were not sort of crouching and bent. Now they had backs were straight suddenly. And it really felt as if they were now sitting on a throne, you know, an earthen throne. And so that's what architecture can do, actually. And that's what design does for you. And I think that's the important thing. And I often say that, you know, when you're poor and you have very little resources, it's the power of design that lifts you from everything else. And that we must never forget that you need to be able to give them the best design possible. I mean, I think they should treat them like our corporate clients, like most architects do, you know? I mean, they are the ones who will really, uh, you know, if you do something of that kind, well-designed, which is more than just a, 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 you know, just a kind of a brick and mortar stuff, but something more. And that's what changes their lives completely. And I love how you just said that, because I think what that brings up is like the, first of all, the plastering image stays in my mind about how much care they have towards what they do. So you give them something, but they care and they make it even more elevated. And And I always say that, if I may, uh, I always say that, you know, when they say I have designed this chula and I I said, no, I don't believe that is so. It's a co-design. I cannot take the credit for it because I have done something, you know, like uh, technical and practical. And then they've taken it to totally another dimension. Everyone is a work of art. Everything, everyone is like a designer stove, you know, it's no longer just a mundane cooking place. It just has no, now it has so many things. So where I had a com- comparatively small platform, now they're became, becoming bigger and bigger because, you know, there's value. They've added value to it. And that's what co-building is about. That's what co-design has to be. You know, we have to go in that direction. And that's the thing that I know about you, Yasmin Appa, which is that you're as inspired by them as they are by you. So it's, you know, sharing those skills and knowledge because I remember several times we've spoken about how they decorate the chula themselves how they paint the artisans paint and the hosting and how they inhabit those spaces and how it makes them feel really empowered just by like you said lifting them off the ground and enabling them to make it themselves and I think there's a lot of care in that which I really really love um And that's something very unique to women. And you said another thing, which essentially, remember when we were talking about women being the custodians of the environment, of climate change, but the best ones, because they carry it so well, you know, they carry these things, they carry children, they carry water, they carry materials. Um, So I think that's a beautiful sentiment. And like I said, these images always stay in my mind when we have these conversations. And I guess... um, We wanted to go a bit off grid with this uh, conversation because, of course, we could talk about the architecture. But one of the other things that came up when we were talking and you mentioned it just now about clothing, you know, the role of clothing as protection, but also as a hazard and, and, and things. And I guess we talked about how when there are floods, about how clothing plays a huge role in, in unfortunately them drowning. And I guess the role of even designers within that context, I think is really interesting, but can you speak a little bit more about that context? Yeah. uh, Again, uh, something that women are so close to that's on them, but can be their empowerment or their almost decline, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's just tragic how many women actually, um, either they drown or they they are not able to uh, uh, take care of themselves. So one of the things that I'm very keen on, which I think is is, uh, really, I think every country must do that, is disaster preparedness, first of all, which means that there are many foreseeable disasters. Of course, there are some that you never can tell, and sometimes you can't tell the severity of it. But a lot of times... You know, the floods, we know where the flooding is going to take place, even know which are the belts in which, you know, the, the seismic zones and so on. And so you can design for those things so that they will, the, the structures will not collapse. Because as you must know, um, it, it's really the structures that kill people, not necessarily the hazard itself. 
because unless the structure is well, I mean, it's robust and it, it can stand, withstand uh, uh, those particular uh, calamities, uh, uh, they're the ones that will be instrumental in, 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 you know, really, you know, loss of lives. So something that's very important. And I think I want every woman to know how to build so that she's able to, first of all, build a structure that would be safe for the family. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, during a flood, uh, first of all, of course, none of them knows how to swim. I yeah. mean, we never teach our girls how to swim. So that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that when they are in water because of the either the dupatta or the sari or the baggy shalwar or whatever, and the shirt, uh, uh, it, it just it, everything drags them down into the water. And so we need really to be able to uh, see how they should, uh, like if they have a dupatta, how they can maybe wrap around themselves so that it's not all over the place or tuck their, their shirts inside. Or if it's a sari, then how do you? So we need to teach them, even if you use the same clothes, uh, you, you need to really tell them how they can, how they can save themselves. Because nobody yeah. is telling them to do this. And, and I know if, as you were saying, Parinda, that maybe there should be some fashion designers that should design yeah. clothes. <laughs> so I don't know whether the fashion That was one of the projects. Like, one, of the, one of the many things me and Yasmin Appa have been cooking up <laughs> is that all these conversations, but it's true. It's about yeah. the responsibility as well of the designer that for me, when we had that conversation, I was thinking, I was thinking, wow, that's profound. Yeah. That the, the butta, that the sari is the thing that we we see as fashion items sometimes as clothing to cover them from shelter. But actually, it can be the thing that, you know, is their biggest barrier when it comes to swimming. So I yeah. do think that's a provocation for designers. It's, yeah. you know, how what would enable women to wrap or what kind of materials or something to float or yeah. again survive in a disaster and I think that was one of the most exciting conversations for me in a way but also very sad because like you said Yasmin Appa the part about swimming again the everyday what equips them to survive in these disasters and we were saying that all women should be able to swim because as you know Pavinda you might know that something like 50 percent of all disasters actually are, are water related either rising sea levels or floods or storms or something like that. So, you know, it's just that we need to, we need to really, most of the countries really have to make sure that the population that is more vulnerable or most vulnerable is equipped with, you know, really uh, the safety measures of all kinds. And certainly, you know, for women, what do you do for women? I mean, the sense that they're the ones who really are the ones who will, uh, and as I said, uh, they may get drowned and nobody can help them because they don't know what to do. I mean, there are lots of boats that capsize, all kinds of things happen in floods, you know. And so we need to tell them or, or how to build, you know, really um, uh, kind of uh, elevated platforms on which everybody can seek refuge or make these. Do you know what a machan is? You know, when you go when you go for um, uh, hunting and you make these structures where you go on the top and you, you know, the lookouts kind of thing where you can shoot from. Well, you need that kind of a contraption in every village. So people are not in water, you know, they're, and, or, or you have my I've designed this floating. Yeah, you designed the raft, didn't you? Yeah. Which is incredible. Yeah. It's, it's very inexpensive. And they should have them everywhere for women and for children and for other vulnerable you know, groups, because you can just be on those and they will just rise with the water and subside. So, you know, we, there's so many ways that, you can protect or provide protection to people. And we are not doing that. That's when you, you need a lot of designers to be working on all this. But that's why I want more architects and designers to get involved in this whole, the whole climate change um, you know, thing that's happening. There are all kinds of things that can be done to, to, to provide protection to people. And I mean, as, as designers, as architects and others, we really carry a responsibility, uh, not only to our wealthy clients to give them the, you know, kind of iconic structures. And I'm happy if people do that. But at the same time, I think a lot of attention has to be paid to these vulnerable groups and the disasters and climate, climate change kind of, uh, you know, affected kind of populations, right? Absolutely. And yeah. I agree there's a there's a kind of responsibility I think that designers now should take that it's not enough actually just uh to design 
for the sake of it. And I think you're someone who yourself went through that journey, right? We all talk talk about your atonement, <laughs> even yeah. though you still can't make the roti, Yasmin Appa, which we are going to do one day. Just yeah. <laughs> to just to bring that back, but look, we're we're closing on time. But the the other thing that we talked about, which was the saying, and this is about protection, shelter, confidence, and the situation. Um, you know, around the globe for a lot of women. But you said this thing about the chadar and the chadavari, and for me, that brought certain things together because we just talked about almost like the cloth and the shelter protection. But can you explain that? The cloth and four walls, right? Yeah, the jadar jadar and the jadar 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 jadar. But can you explain yeah. that? Yeah, because you know, in our context, chadar is something that gives you protection. And that's why women wrap themselves up when they go anywhere because it's they psychologically they feel that then although it's just a just a piece of cloth, but they feel that they are well protected. And we keep on saying we want char divari for everybody, which means you have a you know have a, have a kind of a, a a wall around or a boundary which will protect you. But the fact is that in in most countries. Uh, the way the poverty levels are and disparities that are there, there's hardly any protection, and especially not to women. I mean, it's I think it's just a just a saying which everybody just talks about, but never gets implemented. So I think if in the in, in the uh, in the word and the spirit, if we want to do it, we can actually do it if we empower women and teach them how they can do it for themselves. Because we don't want the international Western colonial charity model. We don't want anybody just giving out. Uh, charity to people. I want them to all become really empowered in the sense that they should feel they can do it for themselves. Because you know, our in our countries, uh, the, most of the most of the governments are highly corrupt. Uh, there's really total lack of governance. I mean, it's terrible how things are. And I feel we need to bypass all this and just get to the people, teach them how they can do it themselves. And we don't need any money from anybody. I think they can just do everything themselves, really, you know, truly. And I, I'm, 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 I'm gradually, I think I'm able to prove that. Yeah, and I know you are through the the barefoot social kind of architecture movements and things like that. But again, to the sentiment, and I completely agree with you, the real empowerment is that they feel... Um, confidence that they can do it themselves so the whole thing for me that again the beautiful thing is it's bittersweet isn't it it's dark and light the yin and yang of it all because the like you said the clothing is supposed to protect us and so are shelters but it's about changing the way women see that in their local context that they see that they're jadar that they're you know, their clothing is the protective thing, is their empowerment. And they see that their shelter is their empowerment. And what's more empowering than the fact that they make it themselves, that they can, yeah. and that yeah. they continue those skills and they're the skills that they'll pass on where they feel that independence. Mm. Um, but I guess we spoke about various things, fireside, uh, <laughs> fireside yeah. chat that this is, but we've got a lot of... Um, kind of provocations I guess for young designers here how they should be thinking about these things so I just want to leave it with final words from you um you know what do you think a young female designer or woman in a community um you know what message do you want to kind of give to them you mean designers or do you mean the community the community itself yeah I mean design well, designers yeah. and community, so maybe uh, you can. Yeah, yeah. Hard well, question. You know, I think I think I'm, words, I mean, I would like, of course, I'd like every young architect and designer to be engaged with humanitarian work. I mean, this is, I think, something that is so important. But I think perhaps more women uh, designers because they can do so much for other women who you know who who, who really don't know they, who have no agency basically. And you know who you need to be advised and and told what they can do to to be able to rise above this terrible abject poverty and and deprivations of the worst order that they go through, and I think there there are ways to lift them and uh, they just need a bit of hope and some guidance and they will do a lot of it themselves. But you need young people to be part of this. They they have to drive this. Because my people of my generation can only do so much. And my generation is not interested, I'm sorry to say, in this kind of work. But I think the young people now with COVID-19, with climate change, with 
displacements with the, you know, these conflicts everywhere and uh, camps all over the place, the, you know, the refugee camps, the camps and there's the climate migrants. There's so much that is there, so many, I mean, millions of people, billions in fact, who require help. So, and I, I feel that even young architects can make a lot of money. It doesn't mean that uh, humanitarian field has no funding. There is a huge amount of funding internationally that's available. I think the governments must support our young designers to work in humanitarian field and, and compensate them. They should not be doing it for free. And the same is true for organizations such as US, UK AIDS, such as US AIDS, such as, such as, I don't know, uh, European Union. And, and there's so many... Uh, aid giving agencies and they're not employing young people to go in in the field and go and help people and i think their whole system must change and this international charity model should be just given up entirely you should not be just throwing money like this if they have money if they have funds it should be for training particularly women how to deal with disasters so and and designers to go out and in the field and to help so i think if we do that we'll just change the whole, that there'll be a paradigm shift in how, you know, we deal with people. And that'd be something really nice if that happens. I'd like to see that happening in my lifetime, if I, you know, I don't know. And Yasmin, you are not, I always tell you, you're not too old and you are doing this. <laughs> That's very and funny. Say it's the younger generation, but you're really a force <laughs> to be reckoned with. But I also just want to quickly say, well, what's the message to the women in the most remote, remote places that you want to I kind of mean, give? Yeah, the women in places are ready, Pavin, that they don't need a message. They need all of us to be there to, to bring them up. They, they, they're they there. They, they will take they, whatever you tell them, they will take it up like, like that. And because they all want to improve their life. They all want to have dignity in their lives. You know, the thing that somebody is poor, so they don't know what dignity is. Well, that's, I think, is a total, you know, no, no. I mean, that's not not right to think but of that. We've seen it, right, Yasmin Appa, with our program as well. We've seen every single woman that has committed to that program, which yeah. we'll share more about um, soon. Yeah. Every another woman fire, that's been another involved. Fireside chat. Yeah, another fireside chat. Exactly. Yes, okay. Has been exceptional <laughs> from the most rural communities to the young female architects to you and a number of women involved. So thank you so much. Um right. <laughs> thank you honestly it's a pleasure you're my good friend and uh you're an amazing woman and so for women of the world thank you <laughs> thank you thank you so much